So without further ado, um, I'm going to talk about my thesis work on defending, uh, on detecting, detecting and defending against jamming attacks in wireless networks. So to start, I'd like to give you the roadmap. First, I'm going to talk about what is jamming and give you a brief history on um, jamming attacks and then talk about what has been done. And then I will talk about my own research. So um, the, since we want to defend against, we want to um, be the jammer. So we start by looking at what type of jamming models are possible. And we actually design and implement four jamming models. And they are quite effective in destroying networks. Uh, after talking about jamming models, uh, I will go on and talk about detecting. And detecting is a hard problem. And we found out that um, not a single statistic such as um, signal strength is enough to do the job. So we came up with a sophisticated um, detection strategy, which involves what we call consistency check. So the idea is basically we want to detect jamming by looking at multiple statistics simultaneously. And then once you detect the jammer, you want to defend against it. We have a couple of defense strategy, and one of them is channel surfing. And I'm going to talk about channel surfing in this talk. And finally, I will wrap up some conclusions and um, with some future direction I would uh, proceed. So before I talk about jamming, let's look at these two people chatting scenario where we have Alice and Bob and uh, their conversation. And so as human, we all know before we start to talk, we will briefly listen. If someone is talking, then we will not uh, start to talk. But this adversary, Mr. X, he totally ignores this etiquette, so he keeps talking, which prevents Alice and Bob from communicating with each other. So what happened in this two people talking scenario is very similar to what's going to happen in wireless networks. Uh, since wireless devices, um, they communicate and uh, use shared media, so which makes them <coughs> vulnerable to jamming attacks. So what is jamming attacks? It's basically somebody is blocking the channel that you are trying to use. You may think that uh, jamming is always intentional, where there's anniversary, shout loudly in the channel that you are trying to use. But in reality, what you see more often is unintentional interference. So for instance, you may already suffer from this device coexisting problem. We all know that 80211, BG, cordless phone, um, Bluetooth, and even microwave oven, they overlap in 2.4 gigahertz frequency band. And sometimes the device can accidentally use the frequency band that's not belong to it. This can happen in cognitive radio scenario. So the point here is those unintentional interference, they will cause the same damage as intentional adversarial and JAMA. So in this thesis work, I'm looking at both cases. So when I um, say jamming, actually I refer to both the unintentional interference and intentional jamming attacks. So jamming has a long history. Um, probably the earliest jamming attack that's related um, is uh, radio jamming. Uh, at that time in World War II, a lot of um, radar was widely used to detect enemy and detect targets. So at that time, people are trying to use mechanical jamming and electrical jamming technique to um, block radar. So for instance, what I show here, this white cloth is chaff. One, one type of mechanical uh, jamming. Uh, so the chaff is consists of small aluminum strips. Those strips can reflect radar waveform, which will produce false target at radar scope. So as a result, the radar cannot tell which target is the real target and which is not. And additionally, um, radio um, jammer was widely used to block radio station that are broadcast by enemy country. So for instance, this picture is the short wind transmitter used by uh, Soviet Union to block uh, Western radio station, the Voice of America. Well, there have been uh, many, um, there have been anti-jamming techniques. And one of them is spread spectrum. And, um, Frequency hopping is uh, one specific um, technique. So the idea of frequency hopping is that I want to um, I want to rapidly switch my channel across a broad a very broad spectrum. So hopefully the jammer only gonna hit some of it, and I still can use the rest to communicate. 
uh, I'd like to point out that this frequency hopping, it relies on a synchronization process, which means uh, you have to make sure that the sender and receiver, they are hopping through the same um, frequency sequence at the same pace, which means it has um, a requirement on the hardware, and this um, synchronization circuit can be a potential point to be attacked. So frequency hopping is not as we always think it's 100% resistant to jamming. It has its weak point. Well, as radio has become more and more um, pervasive uh, in our daily life, jamming also, uh, you can also see jamming in uh, civilian work. Before I go on these slides, um, I want to point out by no means I'm trying to add, uh, encourage you to use those jammers because most of them are illegal. Well, sometimes mm, jammer is not necessarily a bad thing. So for instance, I guess, most of professors would love to have this installed in their classroom because it can block the cell phone reception signal, so meaning no more uh, ring during classes. Well, if you have a lot of speeding tickets, you may like the second jam I uh, listed here. Um, it can block the police mm, speeding gun, but again, it's illegal. Uh, sometimes you can, mm, well, sometimes when um, those teenagers drive by their car with their radio on loudly, you may want to use this radio jammer. Uh, what I show here is a very simple radio jammer. It's a crystal oscillator attached with antenna, and this is a bigger version of the radio jammer. So as a um, member in wireless um, communication community, uh, I'm more interested in jamming in wireless networks. So, um, well, in a lab environment, you can use this wa waveform generator to block, um, to block communication wireless networks. So all you need to do is tune the frequency to the target band and turn it on. Of course, uh, this guy will cost you, it can cost you up to uh, $50,000. Uh, alternatively, you can use Mac layer jammer um, to, uh, you can use the uh, wireless device itself to build what we call Mac layer jammer. And so what you need to do is bypass the um, traditional MAC protocol, and instead you can do things like let the uh, device keep sending out preambles. So um, since jamming has a long history, it has a lot of impact. Uh, naturally, it has attracted many attention from research community. <coughs> Um, before my work, there's a somewhat related work on jamming. Um, people are looking at greedy user behavior and denial of service attack in 802.11. In the literature of jamming attacks, uh, there are works um, whose objective is try to map out the jammed um, area. And we have, uh, we have um, the traditional anti-jamming technique, uh, spread spectrum, uh, which is a physical layer technique. And people are also looking at uh, trying to get the channel capacity of jamming um, channel by using information theory. So if you look at those literature, most of them are either theoretical or simulation based. And so there's actually many questions uh, remain unanswered. For instance, um, can you really build a jammer? And how effective is the jammer to a real network? And, and can you um, defend against um, jamming attacks? And how fast will it take to, for you to de detect jamming? And how fast um, you can recover from jamming attacks? So the objective of my thesis is trying to answer those questions. And, um, and I also want to use commodity devices, meaning that I want to use device you can get when you go to Best Buy. So instead of using uh, some fancy radio which has spread spectrum technique, um, then, which means uh, if I use commodity devices, then usually I only have one radio card. The device I'm looking at can only work on one channel at a time. Well, since I'm a graduate student, so I cannot afford those really powerful military-level jammer, which can like jam span the two to three gigahertz frequency band. So um, I'm interested in Mac layer jammer, and we actually uh, use Mac layer jammer to emulate both the unintentional interferer and intentional uh, malicious jammer. And we choose micro two modes over 80211 because uh, micro two modes, um, it will give me the whole control of the radio stack, um, not like the 80211 devices. A lot of radio operation is hidden in the firmware. So this is um, the micro two modes. It's a small radio devices with operating system on it. 
and I will show you a lot of results where I use this um, platform. So since our ultimate goal is to try to beat, beat the JAMA, so we start by investigating um, how many types of jamming models that we can actually use and we can build and how effective they are. So in total, we came up with four JAMA models which covers both intentional JAMA and unintentional interference. The first JAMA we have is constant JAMA. This JAMA continuously sending out random bits. So if you think you are a legitimate device and you always wait until the channel is idle before you start to send out things, then if this guy is around, then you cannot grab the channel to communicate. Uh, you can think about this constant JAMA as un an unintentional interferer who is in constantly um, sending out things. Well, the second JAMA we have is deceptive JAMA. And this is a malicious JAMA. We call it deceptive because it acts a lot like a, a legitimate device. It keeps sending out regular packets which has proper preamble and CLC. But it doesn't stop in between. So um, since in wireless, device, um, in wireless communication, receiving has higher priority than transmission. So even if you have something to transmit, if this guy is wrong, you are stuck in this receiving mode. So you cannot send anything. These two guys, they continuously sending out things. So the uh, third one we have is called random jamma. This jamma will be um, on for a random amount of time, and it will, um, put in, it will go to sleep for a random amount of time. So you can think about this jamma as some unintentional interference, uh, which is on for some time and off for some time. And finally, uh, we have this reactive jamma. So for the three JAMA we have, they all try to jam proactively. This JAMA will listen to the channel first. If there's nothing going on, then it will remain silent. But as soon as he sends that there's a packet in the air, uh, this guy will Im immediately shout so, um, and um, destroy the packet. And you will see later on, um, the reactive JAMA is very hard to detect. So we actually um, implement all four jammers, and we want to um, evaluate how effective they are. Since um, the, um, the jammer can undermine the communication between the sender and the receiver, so we want to um, check the impact on both sides. At the sender side, if the sender wants to send a certain amount of packet, but due to jamming, it can only let partial packets go through. So this ratio is packet send ratio. And out of all the packets that the sender managed to send, at the receiver side, it may not correctly decode the packet. So, um, so we define the packet delivery ratio at the receiver side. And again, we use MICA2 modes um, to evaluate the jammer's effectiveness. Uh, so if we start by looking at this three-party uh, scenario where there's sender A, receiver B, and the jammer. Um, Gemma X. So later on, we actually observe the same effectiveness in our network. And, and while there's many parameters that can affect the impact of jamming, for instance, the uh, jamming model, the transmission power and distance, and even the uh, MAC protocol employed by the device can be uh, can play its role. Uh, well, it's not necessary and very time consuming to test all the permutation of all those parameters. So we use um, the uh, setup here. So basically, we fix these two guys and move the jammer uh, this way. So here is, um, um, here is the results of two jammer I just talked about. They're all malicious. So um, this is deceptive jammer. So remember, deceptive jammer keeps sending out regular packets without stop in between. So it will put anybody around it to um, listen. That's why you see the zero packet send ratio. Uh, since there's no packet send, then at this um, situation, we define the packet delivery ratio as zero as well. Now, if we look at reactive jammer, well, since reactive jammer will wait until you manage to send out packet. So um, without surprising, we see that the um, packet send ratio was not affected. It's almost 100%. However, out of all the packets uh, you can send, then um, like none of them can be decoded. So um, you see the zero packet delivery ratio. 
uh, you see this 99% is because and this distance is further away. Uh, I, we put the jammer further away from the receiver. Uh, so here, uh, what I want to show you is the uh, packet delivery ratio contour of the map. So I want to convey two points here. First, um, around and when the jammer is close to the receiver, you see zero packet delivery ratio. This is due to jamming. The other point uh, I want to bring up is that you see this contour is not regular. Um, well, um, then I want to highlight the importance of experimental re um, research and system-oriented research. Since the, all the earlier literature in jamming, they all assume a uniform uh, jammed region. But if you look at this plot, obviously that's not correct. No, uh, yeah, we are changing. We fix the receiver and sender and then move the jammer around. We put the jammer at this point and we measure the packet delivery rate. And the distance is feet. Mm -hmm. And this was down in the big orbit room. So having um, talked about how to build these things, and we need to be better people than just build bad stuff. So we, the next thing we want to see how we can detect jamming. And jamming detection is a tricky problem. And um, it's basically trying to differentiate between two scenarios. One is uh, non-jammed scenario, and the other is jammed scenario. For non-jammed scenario, it can include a lot of scenarios like congested scenario and node uh, hardware failure and problem. All those scenarios can be hard to differentiate from jamming scenario. So our methodology is we try to find some property of statistic. So those statistics should be distinguishably different in two scenarios, the jam scenario and non-jam scenario. So one natural property to look at is signal strength. So here what I showed is the signal strength time zero reading uh, where we get by using micro two modes. So this two up plot corresponding to normal traffic CBI is constant bit rate. And we use max traffic to emulate a congested scenario. And then the bottom four plot correspond to four different models we have. So if we want to look at the moving average of signal strengths, if you look at these <coughs> three, then uh, you see that their average is almost the same. So um, that's not a um, good um, statistic. Uh, but if you look at their shape, this normal guy, it um, will, like, there's a lot of up and down mm, mm, going on. But for the constant jammer and deceptive jammer, um, this um, curve is flat. So we think we can use some um, spectrum discrimination technique to differentiate them. So we look at the higher order crossing. Uh, we choose it because uh, high order crossing only evolve and calculate difference between uh, samples, which is uh, ideal for the um, computational constrained platform that we are looking at. So here we um, calculate D1 and D2. D1 is the first order difference. So you can think about it as first order derivative, and D2 is the second order derivative. Now if you look at this plot, you see two clusters. This cluster corresponding to uh, CBR scenario and max traffic scenario, which is um, the um, normal scenario, while this cluster corresponding to these two jammers. So from this plot, we think, OK, we can differentiate them. But how about to, to the other, other two jammers? Uh, for reactive jammer and random jammer, mm, their, um, their like, um, data is um, inside all the traffic in the normal scenario, so which means that uh, we cannot use signal strength spectrum discrimination technique to differentiate them. But uh, this is not a surprise. If you think about a reactive jammer, it actually doesn't change the underlying traffic pattern at all because it's hidden in the traffic. Uh, so which tells us um, no matter how sophisticated your uh, spectrum discrimination technique is, you still cannot mm, detect reactive jammer. We also look at other um, statistics. Uh, for instance, the carrier sensing time at the sender side and packet delivery ratio at the receiver time, uh, at the receiver side. 
Um, so if you look at this, it seems like that packet delivery ratio is an ideal statistic. It can differentiate jamming scenario from normal scenario, even including the congested <coughs> scenario. Well, that's because if it's a jam scenario, then your packet delivery ratio will be um, as low as zero, as I showed in our previous experiment. But if it's a congested scenario, since there's still MAC protocol working, it, try, it will coordinate different um, standards, different uh, users in the network. So the packet delivery ratio will be like uh, approximately 70%. Well, now the question is, is this good enough, the packet delivery ratio? Well, actually, um, the packet delivery ratio will tell you that if it's low, then there's something wrong. But what it does not tell you is why the packet delivery ratio is low. <coughs> is that due to jamming or due to <coughs> other cases? For instance, uh, your sender is moving away from you, or your sender has a hardware um, failing problem. And so uh, in order to deal with those extras, we propose to use consistency check. And we have um, a couple of consistent check strategy, and one of them is we try to looking at the signal strength together with packet delivery ratio to detect jamming. So um, the algorithm works uh, as this. So each node in the node, they will um, run this algorithm independently. <coughs> they will check their packet delivery ratio from time to time. If nothing's going wrong, meaning if the packet delivery ratio are high, then we don't even perform the signal um, consistency checks. However, if all the packet delivery ratio are low, and then we go ahead to check what's the signal strength level. If the signal strength is low, then probably um, the other party is had a hardware failing problem or they are moving away. But if you see a high signal strength, then probably you're jammed. So now the question is, uh, how do you define low signal strength, high signal strength, and what does consistency mean? Uh, so our um, approach is we try to divide the packet delivery ratio and signal strength space into two regions. And in one region, um, all the jammed uh, node will um, data pair will fail in, and while in the other node in region that um, the normal data packet will um, the normal measurement will fail in. Uh, so, for instance, this um, black dot corresponding to um, the data we measured uh, when there is no jammer, uh, while all those uh, colored marks they corresponding to different jammer we have, they all fail in this region. Uh, this is the uh, experiment setup. So from this prop, um, plot, it um, tells us that this um, consistent check-based technique is uh, ideal in detecting jamming uh, attacks. It can detect all the jammer models we have. Uh, so what we did is actually we uh, first measure these black dots. Those are in the normal case what you're going to observe. And then we um, put them into the bin, and then we choose the 65% as our threshold. This is, um, well, because um, uh, as I mentioned, the in the congested scenario, you can still get 70% of the packet delivery ratio. Uh, so uh, we choose uh, 65 as the threshold. It's like, like empirical. Yeah, that's possible. Um, so we are looking at um, the network that's actually well designed. So, um, well, first of all, it's relatively well designed. Uh, you won't see a lot, um, like 20% congested scenario. And second, I say the congested scenario usually won't last too long. While jamming, if the jammer is there, it's always low. For the congested scenario, you will see oscillation. Right? Sometimes you get high packet delivery ratio. Sometimes you don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's um, definitely a way to do that. Okay, so having talking about how to detect jamming, now um, the next thing you want to do is actually defend against jamming. Mm, so what can you do when there's a jam around? You want to send something, but um, someone is using the channel all the time. If you remember the um, the um, the chat, 
the uh, the cloud I show you in World War II. As actually, that um, mechanical jammer was designed independently by three countries a long time ago. But uh, for a long time, no one used it because um, they think it's more dangerous to use it than not. Uh, they don't know how to defend against the chaff. And they worry that if they use it, their enemy can easily duplicate the weapon and use it against themselves. So which tells us that jamming is very easy to employ, but it's very hard to um, defend. Well, if in a wired case, you see if this, um, if this guy is doing a bad thing, then you can couple link that cause the problem. But we're in wireless, so scissors won't work now. Well, luckily, um, we have this um, Chinese um, war strategy book. Uh, it points out that if your enemy is too strong and you have no way to um, defeat your enemy, then the best strategy is to run away. Uh, in its native version, it's So therefore, we propose a couple of retreat strategy, and one of them is uh, channel surfing, where we actually try to escape in the frequency domain. And the other is spatial retreat, um, where you, you can retreat in the geographic domain. And in this talk, I'm only going to talk about channel surfing. So the idea of channel surfing is uh, very simple. It's that if someone is blocking the channel that you are using, then you'd better move to another ch safe channel. Safe meaning orthogonal to the old one, meaning interference free. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, channel surfing is inspired by frequency hopping. However, that's a, um, it's different. Uh, first of all, our channel surfing works on link layer, which means we don't have special requirement on hardware. And also, um, well, our channel surfing only start to change channel when some ba something bad happens. So you can think about uh, channel surfing as on-demand link layer frequency hub. Well, although the idea of channel surfing is pretty simple, but um, to implement, it's a different story. Um, you have to accomplish all those things in a distributed manner. So you are dealing with all the complexity associated with asynchrony, latency, and scalability. So just to give you an example, let me look at this um, network. The yellow dots are nodes, and the dotted lines are links. When a jammer comes in and starts to shout, what this jammer end up doing is it will block this four node. So after some time, this four node will detect that they're jammed, so they will move to the new channel. Now, if you look at this um, picture, it's apparently um, this network won't work because it's partitioned in the frequency domain. So we need uh, some um, algorithm to repair on, or at least to bridge the, those two frequency domains. And then you will see who can start to repair the network. Definitely not the guy sit here and not the jam node. If you look at this blinking red node, they are very special. We call them boundary node. They themselves are not jammed, but they are the neighbor of the jam node. So they should take the responsibility to start to repair the network. And mm, depending on how they repair the network, we have a couple of channel surfing strategy. And they all follow this same framework. So we uh, let e everybody in the network try to detect whether they have, have mm, their neighbor is still there. If they found their, mm, some of the neighbor is missing, they were trying to looking for their neighbors. Once they found their neighbor and conclude that their neighbor are jammed, then they will start to repair the network. So the first, um, well, so, um, well, there's a lot of issue associated with this framework um, when we implement it. So for instance, uh, how can you detect that your neighbor is missing? Detecting your neighbor missing in a um, timely fashion is very hard. You cannot just wait up to two days and say, oh, geez, where's my neighbor? Then you already lost a lot of data. Uh, well, to detect your neighbor in uh, real time is uh, almost like impossible, so there's trade-off here. Assume the first issue is a solve, then the next issue is how can you make sure that if you want to look for your neighbor in the next channel, and he's there waiting for you. Since it's a distributed algorithm, you um, go there um, independently. And there are some times when the boundary node go to the channels um, too soon, and where the jam node has not been there yet, then they will miss each other. Well, another tricky issue is how can you choose channel? 
So remember, we are in this um, interference scenario. There's no way for the boundary node to negotiate which channel it can use with the jam node. So the channel uh, allocation sequence has to be predetermined. Well, however, you don't want this sequence to be too trivial, then the adversary can easily predict where you're going to go. It can follow you. So we propose to use a keyed pseudo-random generator to um, randomize the um, channel allocation. And finally, um, let's mm, look at how um, we can mm, resume the network connectivity. The first strategy we have is coordinated channel surfing. The idea here is that if uh, someone is jammed, then we'd better let the whole network move to uh, the new channel. So let me go through the um, procedure quickly. Starting from these four nodes, they um, detect their jam, they move to a new channel. Then after some time, this boundary node will um, find, OK, um, my neighbor is missing. So I'd better go to the second channel, the new channel, to detect their, to find their neighbors. Once they found their neighbors in the new channel, they will go back and broadcast out a channel switch command. After everybody receives this channel switching command, they will move to a new channel. So we implement this strategy using MICA2 modes. And this is uh, the typical um, setup for uploading code. So during those days, I was most often see on the ground, on the floor, no, on the ground, on the floor, uh, picking up the nodes, upload codes, and put them back, and then repeat it 30 times for those nodes again, again, again. <laughs> and this is the deployment we have. Uh, we have 30 nodes. And so, um, well, the application we use is called Surge. There's one sync connected to the computer. All the rest, they will periodically report data to this sync. And the underlying protocol, um, routing protocol used is um, tree-based. So this is a Java GUI used to capture the real-time topology. And zero is the sync. So if you turn this plot 180 degrees, then they should match. So if I put a jammer here and then turn it on, in real time, I will see that this jammer will kill the link here, but it will not affect the link that's further away from the jammer. Now let's take a closer look at the throughput plot um, of various nodes I picked. So um, you see that um, in an ideal case, if there's no jammer, then um, all the um, nodes should deliver 10 packets to the in, during each window time. However, due to the radio irregularity and a lot of um, unstable things, so you didn't see 10, you see the sum of fluctuation. After jammer is turned on, we see that the jammer will have different impact to the nodes depending on how far away those nodes um, are um, from the jammer. For those three nodes, they are closer to the jammer, so their throughput drops to zero. However, for these three nodes, they are further away from node. Although you see this dip, this is due to the MAC um, adaptation, but overall it's normal. So after some time, you see our algorithm kicks in, and everybody will um, resume their connectivity in the new channel. And although you see this, um, there's uh, this delay, and you see that the majority of the delay of network repairing is devoted to detecting JAMA. Uh, you may ask why. Uh, this is because um, in our network, in sensor network, there's a lot of transient events going to disturb the network communication. So if you let the network start to react to every event that happens, then the network won't be stable. So we choose this um, detection time to 40 packets to avoid false alarm. And if you look at this um, cumulative channel change plot, then the advantage of this long delay is pretty obvious because we don't see any um, false positive here. Most of nodes, they only change uh, their frequency once. They move to a new channel. Well, only the boundary node, it changed three times. So the first time, it goes to a new channel looking for its neighbor. Second time, it go back to the old channel, broadcast a command. And third time, they move to that new channel permanently. Uh, for the, um, the coordinate channel surfing um, strategy, it requires that everybody in the network change to the new channel. Well, sometimes it may not be a, an efficient way if the jammed region is really um, small compared to the whole network. That's why we think um, in some cases um, we can use uh, spectral multiplexing, where the idea is that we let those jammed nodes 
working on channel 2, let those not affected nodes working on old channel, and let the boundary nodes, let them working on both channel 1 and channel 2, so they can grab the packet in channel 2 and later on send it out through channel 1. Well, since the device we are using only have one radio card, it can only work at one channel at a time. So we need some synchronization um, uh, strategy to um, like coordinate sender and the receiver. So that's why we have uh, two uh, sub spectral multiplexing strategy. And one of them is synchronous spectral multiplexing. The idea is that we want let the, every node in the network working on the same clock. And this uh, global clock is divided into slots. Um, so in each slot is assigned to one channel. Mm, during that slot, only the node that um, need to work on that channel will transmit. Uh, and otherwise, it will remain silent. So let me quickly go through this example. So for instance, this node D is jammed. And we have um, C as the boundary node. During slot 1, A, B, E, F they will communicate the boundary nodes in C in channel 1. At the end of channel, at the end of slot 1, and C will um, stop talking with its neighbor and it will change its channel to channel 2. And during um, the slot, <coughs> during slot 2, a node, and this node D will talk with boundary node and all other nodes will remain silent. Now the challenge here is how can you synchronize the whole network efficiently? So um, I will skip the detail, but the idea is that we let the loot broadcast a simple sync um, message. So as a result, all the network will synchronize with their local, their neighbors loosely. And it turned out that the loose synchronization is already good enough for our job. And alternatively, uh, you can let the um, boundary node itself decide its schedule, decide when I want to stay in which channel for how long. Um, so in, in this asynchronous spectrum, let's look at this example. Assume this node D is jammed, and node A is the boundary node. It needs to talk with B and C. So node A will decide when I want to stay in old channel. And um, when it um, stays in the old channel, A will inform B and C, tell them I'm here. And based on its local, A's local situation, like the buffer utilization, the traffic, it can dynamically decide how long I will stay here. Once he decided to switch to a new channel, A will inform B and C. And then in the new channel, A will similarly tell D, I'm here, you can send me packing now. So the real challenge in this um, algorithm is how can A smartly decide how long I'm going to stay here because A don't have the information of its children's buffer utilization and all its center. So here is the uh, throughput result I get. Um, here um, we have the similar observation as in the um, broad, in the coordinated channel surfing strategy. We see that the jammer will have different impact on a node, and some nodes are jammed while the others are not. And some nodes will repair our, depend, depend on our algorithm to repair its um, connectivity to the network. Mm, so, um, and the majority of the delay is devoted to um, detect jamming. And after jammer is detected, the repair um, procedure is pretty fast. Well, um, I'd like to point out this three-channel surfing algorithm. Um, they are not meant to compare with each other. I mean, it's not meaningful to compare their absolute result. They are designed for different scenarios. So for instance, think about in a large uh, network where the jam, the region is very small, or the jammer is there for a long time, maybe um, for mm, the lifetime of the mm, operation of the network. And in that case, then you might want to use a uh, broad um, um, so let me uh, let me retry. I think I made a, made a mistake. So think about this scenario: if the jammed region is really large compared to the rest of the network, and and the jammer is there all the time, and in that case, you might want to use coordinated channel surfing. You want to let everybody to move to the new channel. Uh, in other case, if the jam region is very small and jammer is only there for a short period of time, then you don't want to let the whole network to move. 
you only want those uh, factor nodes to um, put and change to the new channel and let somebody doing relaying, then in that case, if the jammer is going away, then you can let those guys come back. You're not disturbing the whole network. Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I point out that there's um, some work before um, we started to do our um, channel surfing and detection work. And um, now people are trying to look at um, jamming attacks. Um, and there's people propose to uh, use a wormhole-based technique and try to um, cope with jammer. And people are also looking at how to do channel hopping 802.11. And there's some follow-up work by uh, Matard on channel capacity. And so that's pretty much the highlight of my thesis work. Looking forward, I want to give you a sense on what I plan to do in the future. I divided my future direction into uh, short term and long term. In short term, um, I plan to uh, working on the channel surfing. I still plan to working on jamming um, problem. This is an interesting and important problem. Our channel surfing strategy um, still need to be improved to deal with um, a more advanced uh, jammer. For instance, what if there's multiple jammer? They jam multiple channels. And what if the jammer can chasing you around? Then in that sense, how uh, can we approve channel surfing strategy dealing with those? And alternatively, in some case, you might want to let your device to compete with the jammer. So for instance, you can raise uh, your device's power, or you can use different error correcting code and try to, um, try to increase the reliability of your packet delivery. Well, finally, we have um, this very interesting idea of timing channel. So um, the idea is that, well, now instead of we're increasing, we'll let our receiver to correctly decode the packet. We're not trying to do that, but we're trying to use the fact that um, <coughs> your receiver might see the packet, but the packet cannot pass the CRC check. It will be dropped. This fact is already conveying information. So if somehow we can recall the time when the packet is arrived, and we record a sequence of that time, and then we look at inter-arriving time, then we can use inter-arriving time to convey information. For instance, we agree on that if the inter-arriving time is 10 seconds, then you want to say zero. You want to say no to me. If the um, inter-arriving time is 20 seconds, then you want to say yes to me. So by doing that, you can actually transmit bits information. And so we already have some initial result on um, timing channel, and I'd like to study it in a um, network um, scenario. Well, looking forward, I don't plan to do only jamming. I also want to look at other issues uh, in future wireless networks, uh, like uh, IFID vehicle network and uh, mesh network. Um, well, um, mm, I want to um, use this cognitive radio and try to use that uh, as a platform to investigate a lot of security issues. For instance, I want to secure the cognitive radio networks. I want to um, do some privacy-related work in the cognitive radio. Since cognitive radio is so powerful, it, um, it opens all the radio stack to the user, and the user, it's almost like can do everything and use it. You can think this cognitive radio as an ideal platform to build Jammer. Um, this is one example. So um, let me conclude here. Well, um, due to the sheer nature of wireless networks, and um, they are very vulnerable to um, jamming attacks, and as well as unintentional interference. Um, this uh, thesis has served as first attempt and try to um, dealing, answer many questions like, um, how can you um, build a jammer? How, how effective is the jammer? And how can you detect the jammer? And how can you repair the um, network performance, uh, repair the network communication in the presence of jammer in a realistic network setup? Uh, so um, that's probably it. And I think I talked too fast again. <laughs> um, I'm ready to take any.